Welcome back to the Roads to Wealth podcast. I'm your host, Josh Rhodes. And while I feel like I say this every week, I've got a hell of an episode in store for you this week. As an ex or a former college athlete myself, someone that still competes on a daily basis on the mats in jiu-jitsu, this is an interview that I've had circled on my calendar for a really long time. Today's interview is with Marcus Ogden. Marcus is a former NFL football player who actually played for the Titans, the Bills, the Ravens, the Jaguars, but today he works for himself. He decided to take off on this sort of entrepreneurial journey back in 2013 where he's now a keynote speaker, a business coach, a consultant, and two-time best-selling author. He has two books out that we'll, we'll explore here on the podcast. This man has one hell of a journey, and it makes for a stellar, stellar story that we're able to extract in, in this interview. I held off on releasing this episode for a couple extra months in that I recorded this right before his second book came out. I already had it pre-ordered. It was on its way. I've now had the chance to chew all the way through that, and I'm happy to sort of give my endorsement for what that's worth and that this book is stellar. He does a great job at covering it here in the podcast. So maybe we'll recap it here in the outro. But I thought he did a phenomenal job at sort of exploring some of the details here in this hour. We also try to spend a few cycles on exploring some other interesting topics. How does the NFL prepare their athletes for the real world? As an entrepreneur that's wearing tons of hats, if you're not the sort of go-getter sales guy, how do you properly execute a deal and ensure that things go according to plan, right? Marcus has a, a really low point here with his construction company that it literally gives me chill bumps He's, even as I listen back to the editing process. And finally, I mean, this Marcus has a true story of how hard work and perseverance can pull you through what feels or seems to be the most difficult times you know, job, car, home loss, down on funds and or resources, whatever it is, stay the course, keep grinding. Let's get to it. Well, Marcus, first and foremost, man, from a preparation standpoint, I've got to say, I was pretty pumped for this just because typically in a podcast prep, I'm watching videos, I'm reading, but it's all wealth specific. This is the first time I was able to do. Uh, I was able to watch some highlight film as well. <laughs> nice. Able to <laughs> able to watch some football highlight film, which was really exciting for me. I would typically start a podcast, man, by asking you to tell me what you got going on now. Though I think you're a bit different in that. I think your story speaks just volumes. And so, if you're comfortable with it, let's kick this off by just maybe kind of giving me your background and how you sort of got to this point. Yeah. So again, my name is Marcus Ogden. I'm originally from Washington, D.C. Uh, my brother, Jonathan Ogden, and I were raised by a single father in Washington, D.C. Our father actually had a degree from Howard uh, in economics then got his master's at University of Maryland economics. And he worked in the financial planning world. I uh, worked for the Federal Homeless Bank of New York in their D.C. office. My brother and I were raised to really respect you know, ourselves, women, education, all that great stuff. Football was always a part of our life. You know, I ended up going to play football at St. John's College High School, and then went off to Howard, and then got to the NFL and played uh, almost six years in the National Football League. My brother went to UCLA, first round draft choice, first pick ever of the Ravens, and he had a 12 year career, first battle Hall of Famer with the uh, with the Baltimore Ravens. So, you know, we grew up around football, education, and financial literacy from a very young age, and then I ended up after my career. I transitioned into another part of my life, which would be construction. Hmm. And you mentioned your father has background in finance. I mean, as you're a child, was the talk of money, was it pretty fluid? Did you know where you guys were at from maybe a wealth status? And was he giving you insight into maybe some things to do with your money and, and how to create or build wealth? Were you getting that at a young age? Yeah, probably around the time I was around a freshman in high school, we started having those conversations. A lot of his money was gone at that point because he put my brother through high school. My brother's high school was $22,000 a year back in the late 80s. So it's about 50000 a year now 
to go to St. Albans High School in D.C. So my father had about close to $90,000 saved, like, you know, uh, when my brother was in high school right around his freshman year, which is right about right because my parents divorced when I was eight and my brother had just turned eight. My brother was 14 and a half. So the last three to four years of high school, my father was paying for all that by himself with no help from my mother. So by the time I got to high school, we didn't have any money, but I learned about money because I was in middle school, I'm sorry, in elementary school and middle school, we had money. It's just my father was hoping to get another job at that point, but it never did happen because he got sick with kidney failure. So the money he had put away by close to like a little over 90000 if he would have got a job after being let go from the Federal Home Loans Bank, it would have been a smooth transition, but that never happened. So that savings got dipped into every year for my brother's high school, for living expenses, all that. And by the time I got to high school, we were pretty much financially strapped. Yeah. It doesn't sound like he was saving. That money wasn't being set aside for the academic portion. I mean, that was an emergency fund. Correct. Yeah. Because my father was making close to $150,000 a year at that time in in the late eighties. Hey, that's great money today. But so that's probably close to like $300,000, $350,000 today. And my mom was probably making about close to a hundred ish as an attorney for the DC government. So Again, when my brother went to the high school, I mean, you know, you talk about income total of close to a quarter million dollars, 10% of that was my brother's high school combined. That's great management. There's no issue. That's great. Problem was parents divorced. That money went away from my mom's side. Dad lost his job. That money went away. So my dad had, like you said, that was more for like his beginning of like his like retirement fund. That's what that was for. So that came about. Gotcha. So you leave the NFL, you get started in construction business. Where's construction from? Great question. So I ended up during the NFL, I went to a program at USC uh, development and this real estate. And then I ended up going to an event at Morgan State where Congressman Elijah Cummings, who actually just passed away probably about three or four months ago. Congressman Cummings was a very big advocate of uh, Barack Obama and a huge, huge respect as a congressman. He had an event at Morgan State, and I was coming to get some information about construction and the whole nine yards, and he talked about one of you all in here who has the ability and who has the perseverance and grit to start a construction business and really sit at the table with non-minority contractors will do well. So between my little bit of knowledge that I got during the NFL, and then going to that event at Morgan State, it inspired me to actually go full carte blanche into construction in 2008. I mean, going into that, did the NFL provide any sort of business financial training? I mean, how leaving the league, how do you know what to do or how to get started in the, in the business realm? Well, my father passed away in 2006. So at that time, I took a little time off from football, spent some time reading, spent some time trying to gather my knowledge about different things. And I have a degree in finance and I did a lot of work with some entrepreneurs and I was around entrepreneurs, things like that during my off season. Uh, Cause I always stayed where I was and I lifted with the team and ran and all that. But I also spent time, you know, going around different businesses, some of our you know, community sponsors and partners. And I learned about business. So I took that knowledge and then I put it into my business, which was construction. And then that's kind of how I got myself going there. But at the time that I retire, there were no programs like there are today. Like today, when guys retire, there's the retired NFL PA organization. There's the NFL trust. There's the legends. As a matter of fact, I just got an email today about uh, the career fair. There's a career fair at every Super Bowl. The trust will put on a career fair like people um, – Organizations like Pepsi or UPS or even the FBI will come out and if players want to learn how to get jobs or intern, things like that, they also have different things like call like Athlete, where they teach you about business or they help you with getting a mentor. I actually went to a great program. I went to a great program at Penn State, which was amazing, talking about how to take the knowledge and verbiage from football and sports 
and transcend it and then transition into the corporate business world as an entrepreneur, as an employee, as a leader. So today, the NFL does an amazing job with all the programs they have to help uh, current and retired players. Mm. Man, that's really interesting because, I mean, you think about the NFL as a business and their ability to cycle through vicious as that sound, cycle through athletes, right? And when you're at the top of your game, you're on the field. And when you're not, I was under the impression that they were sort of just left out there to make their decisions and figure things out. But it sounds like they've begun to put some classes and some foundational steps and practices in place for the athletes, which is great. Well, that's how it was when I retired, right? But the problem was, and still is, unfortunately, a lot of players were ending up financially strapped, bankrupt, broke, or making some bad decisions. So it ended up being where the, some, when, a, when a lot of players have, go through that, it doesn't look good for the league. Like, they don't want to have their former players bankrupt, broke, or they, it's not a good look. So in the 2013 CBA agreement, I believe that's the year that's correct. I'm pretty sure that's correct the year. They formed the trust, the Retired Players Association, designed to work with retired guys and, then the, and current guys around this topic because again current guys would have like the player engagement director but even when i was playing that guy was not really doing anything around like life skills or things like that we would go to a symposium that they had for every drafted rookie that we went to as a matter of fact kate mang was on a panel when i went my rookie year which was an amazing experience for me to meet peyton manning in person hear him talk was fantastic and then but even now today, the teams are responsible for their own education of the rookies and the veterans. So the directors of player engagement will hire people to come in and talk. Like, for example, one of my clients is the Buffalo Bills. So I actually just sent, we'll talk about later in the podcast, I just sent my book to Marlon Kerner, who is a director of player engagement for the Buffalo Bills, who are my clients. Great man, great guy. And the Bills are really concerned about making sure their players, their current players, understand how to leverage so when they leave the game, they have some options for themselves, right? So you're seeing a lot more head coaches just really wanting that because they want to have their guys go out after they're done and have a good mark in, uh, in the community. Totally. I mean, for the athlete, it makes so much sense. For the league itself, it makes sense for the, for the coaching or for the, for the team. You're absolutely right. And I was going to make this point in that most of the time when we hear athletes, especially the, the really successful athletes, have gone through their mark, they've left their mark in the NFL and they leave. When we hear they've gone bankrupt or they've gotten some sort of financial hardship, I mean, without doing any research, I think all of us would be willing to bet that it's due to their, them being frivolous, right? And spending it on cars or you've got a bit of a, of a unique case here, a bit of a unique story. I guess one, that's not always the case, right? Because they're providing training and they're looking to sort of structure that. And it sounds like they're putting more money towards that now. I do want to sort of complete your background story. You went through some hardship yourself, right? And it's not due to the frivolous spending ways. Rather, you obviously took business seriously with the finance background. You had training. You had a team that you put together. You were doing your research and homework. You leave the NFL. You start this construction business. Kind of complete that story for me. Yeah. So I started the construction company in 2008. And we started out small. We started out doing some demolition work which is no risk. It's like you get a couple pieces of equipment, you demo some job sites, some concrete, you bust stuff up, ballers, all that. Then we got into laying the concrete, which was a little bit more risky, but not that bad because you know, if you mess up, it's pretty cheap for the most part, you can redo it. Then we got into seven road control and like, you know, all this other stuff and erosion of the earth and making sure everything was like kept nice and tight. At this point, are, you've got a small team. Do you own equipment? Like how much have you put... Is this all the NFL money going into this? No, no. At the beginning, we started so it was so small that we rented stuff. That's all. Yeah, I'll sort. Yeah, we rented some stuff, you know, like for the day, for the week. We kept it small. And if I had done that as the company grew, if I'd have stayed like that for like 10 years, I'd still be doing it today. The problem was I had such success because the market crashed in 08. A lot of the big people went out. 
we were minority certified. The commercial market was still booming. Money was flowing like hotcakes. And a lot of my competition went out of business. So we were like the only game in town in the 2009 to 2010. So then after doing seven, was, again, we started in demo, then site, then concrete, then seven roads control. Then we start doing some small utilities like stormwater sewer, riskier, but not that bad. Then we got into the big boy, which is the big risk factor, which also can make the most money, site work, great, you know, earth moving, picking up, scooping up dirt and hauling it out. Because if you end up making a mistake in the bidding, woo, it can bankrupt you. I mean, easily. One wrong bid and earthwork, and you underbid how much dirt you have to take off a job site, you're done. That's why you have to have great estimators, great project managers. So we had all that. And 2010 and 11, for two years, we were the largest African-American minority subcontract in the city of Baltimore in the state of Maryland. We were a multi-million dollar a year, eight-figure per year annual business. We grew. Problem was, in 2012, we took on a big job for a big client. It was a little over $4 million project. And we bought something that we should have never bought. We bought the drying of the site, also known as the dewatering. You have to come in and suck the water off the job site through your pumps in the ground and haul it out of there. We did that. We hired a subcontractor. They did their job, signed off on. Another contractor started to lay the concrete to take the building vertical. The water kept rising. And we're like, whoa, we dried it. What's going on? So we called our contractor that did the dewatering, and we signed off on it, them leaving, so they were done. So then we went to the owner and the developer and the contractor and said, hey, man, this isn't here. Like, what's going on? We finished our work. Well, just don't worry about markets. Just take care of it. We'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. Do the work. We're going to take care of you on the change order. Just keep it going. Sure. Okay. Why not? That client gave me one of our first big seven-figure jobs like a couple months prior. I'm like, they're not going to hurt us. They love us. They're going to take care of us. So we did the work. No sign change order, nothing in writing, just a handshake. Spent about between two to three million dollars in 90 days. Went to go get paid back from the developer and contractor. They said, great job with the work, Marcus. This work looks all organized, but this is part of your original buyout. We're not going to give you a change order for it. Oh, man. And I said, what? I'll never forget the meeting with the guy from the development company who had that smug, smirk look on his face. And he sat there and said, well, you know, Marcus, you know, this is kind of a lesson for you. We're trying to teach you good business and this smug, smirk look. And I remember it took everything I had not to jump over the table and just, it just took everything I had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rip his head off. Yeah. So after that, that was in December. Oh, God. And then we went to, that was the beginning of December. And I remember we were about to sell our business out to a very well-known individual. I mean, he's not a celebrity. Well, I guess he kind of is a celebrity. His son and uh, his partners were going to buy out my partner's interest because they saw the upside. Even with this bad debacle, they saw the upside. And I remember they were getting ready to sign the contract to buy out my partner. And we had something show up at the door from the UPS guy. And it was a filing of another company trying to sue us. So it's basically the UPS had dropped off a case file of a client that we had a partnership with, but they said, well, we're not partners anymore. We were your sub and you owe us hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it showed me the door. Well, instead of being honest and saying this is what happened, my partner told the people, oh, no, no, it's just, that's just the, the mail. Don't worry about it and all that. But they were not stupid. They could tell you don't sign off on something like that. And you don't have it be in this huge document binder and you open it up and it says judgment on the front. You don't, you know, you know, you know, case filing, looking for a judgment. They could see all that. And they didn't even have to read it, but they could just see it on my face. And I, I was like, just like, and Sham was like, wow, I was shocked. And instead of being honest, he just tried to make it like it wasn't anything. And they said, well, okay, you want to act like that, we're going to pull the deal. They pulled the deal and then 
that was basically like the second or third week of January. They pulled the offer. And I had another partner that was looking to try to get, help us get our bank line increased. The bank shut us down. That was the last week of January. First week of February, I know we're, fin- we're finished. Wheels fell off. Yep. The deal fell through with that party. It was going to buy out my partner. The bank shut our line down. The other two partners were looking to maybe come in. They walked away. That was it. Damn. So you had a business partner. Is that someone from the league or someone that you no. met while you're playing? I met this gentleman from another individual, and he was 41 years my elder. And I should have never gone into business with him because I would have ran a thorough background check on him. I would have known that he didn't have any construction commercial experience. He had residential experience, but no commercial. So if I would have realized that going in, I would have never partnered with him. But I was, again, I was young. I didn't do anything. And I tell you all the time, there's five rules when you're going to own a business today that you should live by. Know your business, vet your partner, vet your employees, always be properly funded, know when to walk away. Those are the five. I didn't do any of those five with Caden. Mm. I was going to ask you, and I think that's the answer. I'm sure everyone does this, but as an athlete, I find when I go through a major failure, any failure, but when I go through a major failure, I try to take time, probably not immediately after, but there shortly after to reflect on that and see what's the silver lining here, right? What did I learn from this experience? What, what did I take from this? What's going to scar over and what am I going to take from this, right? I'm assuming you tackled that, which is a major loss. I'm assuming you tackled that with a very similar mindset. Any big or key takeaways from the extreme high to the low? And obviously, I think next we're going to go back to what are you doing now, right? But are there any takeaways from the failure? Yeah, the takeaways are that explosive growth does not mean good growth. You don't want to go from a million to four to eight to 12. You don't want to have those type of juggernaut jumps because in business, especially if you're in a heavy cash business, if you're jumping that high, that means your payroll and your staff are doing a lot of work. Well, you sometimes run the risk of clients paying you late, not paying you, stalling, and then you have to absorb all that payroll cost. So you need to have plenty of cash reserves to grow a business. And that was our problem is our bank line should have been used for emergencies. Our bank line at the end became the lifeline to pay for that job along with all of my capital, all of my credit cards. I took out a Bell, a business equity line on my home for $22,500. That was maxed out. We ended up going to a loan shark to get $150,000 from him that we had to pay back within three months and had to pay him $174,000. So we were paying like almost 40% interest on that money annual annually, right, that we had to pay him back. And by the time we paid him back after everything else, that money was gone. So basically, everything we were doing was borrowed money. Yeah, you're just burying deeper, man. That's tough. It's so tough. It's so tough to get out of that. And again, looking at it now, that's the number one thing I did incorrectly was I ended leveraging. I didn't really know what was assets and what was debt. I thought the 150, you know, money from the guy that we took from the loan shark was an asset. It was a debt. But I looked at the bank line as an asset. It was a debt. Even though I have a finance degree, right? When you're in the situation of running a business and you're in the trenches and you're not stopping to think like, so like right now in my current business, I just hired a great tax accountant that my brother-in-law, who's our financial planner, referred to me. I just hired a fantastic bookkeeper to help us process all incoming money, all expenses, so we can have a great, we can always have, at the, at the, starting 2020, every month we'll get a printout of invest of income. What bucket does it fall into? Is it speaking for our business? Is it coaching? Is it consulting, right? Because my wife owns the business, so I work for her. So is it speaking? Is it consulting? Is it coaching? What bucket does it drop into? We'll get nice and clean, pretty, 
financial statements every month starting in 2020. We even brought her on to kind of help fill us in from 19 going forward. But now I understand what is assets, what's debt. Like people think credit cards are assets, they're debts. Like, again, I have a credit card I'm using right now. I'm so glad we're just kind of discussing I'm, I'm this, this kind of overall show, you know, uh, overall perspective. I have a secure credit card I got trying to build my credit, $200 limit. I spend 20 bucks a month on it maximum, pay it off every month to build the credit. But uh, other credit cards, they're only, I'm only paying like the $7 a month charge. That's like the monthly charge to keep it in case I need it. I'm only paying like, or, or I'm paying like $169 for the year for the other cards in case I need it. If I'm using that credit card, it's something I plan to pay off the next month or I don't use it at all. But again, when my wife and I were together in 13, like we met, we met in 12, in 13, I mean, we, we were, you know, we got a credit card in like 2014. Like, oh man, we got another asset. We would charge it. And I'm like, man, I borrowed two grand. I got to pay back $2,300. I'm like, wait a second. So basically, I got to pay back the full amount, principal plus $300 of interest. I'm like, man. But again, this is how the credit card companies put their hands into people and it doesn't come out. Because you're always paying. Like, well, I'm paying, like, well, so you have a credit card for 10 grand and, it's ma- and that's the maximum. And you're paying you know, 500 bucks minimum a month. Well, I'm paying the, uh, the payment. Like, no, 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 you're paying the interest. You're not paying the principal. So it's amazing how between 2010, 2013, a lot of things that I thought were assets of ours, business line, uh, the bell that I had, the huge one and a half million dollar credit line, you know, the $150,000 that we borrowed twice from that individual. I thought those were all assets. Every last one of them was a debt. So you hit this, I mean, I'm going to call it a rock bottom just because I can't think of anything worse to call it. And if I could, I'd call it that. Because I mean, you're deep at that point, right? I'm sure that puts stress in the household, on the relationship, on you, on your, I mean, everything, right? What do you use or how do you start digging yourself out of that? What's your turning point and what, what's that catalyst to get you going? So my wife and I, when in 2012 we met, we started dating. She moved in with me about five months later. So she moved me in November. By February of the following year, I'm filing the bankruptcy. So basically four months of her being with me, which she didn't sign up for, I'm filing the bankruptcy. I remember telling her, all right, so it's going down. Business is going down. I'm going down. It's all going down. You can either stay with me and try to help get out of it, which would be lovely, or you can go. You've been together for like seven, eight months. You didn't sign up for this. I'm, I'm, either way, I'm fine. She stayed. So we moved to Carolina and, uh, at that time. So we moved, we got here April 2013. Literally, we had four to five dollars in the bank. That's all we had. Everything else was gone. No credit cards. They were all maxed out. No money in the bank. Nothing. Everything's gone. My house was foreclosed on. Both cars repossessed. In the same week, the week we got here, April 15th, 2013. By April 22nd, 2013, both cars were repossessed, taken off of our lot, off of our rental property. Both of them is taken off by the repo man. Because I remember he kept calling, kept calling, and he called like eight times a day. I said, man, I can't anymore. And then one guy called, came got the one car. Another guy called, came got the other car. They were both gone and it was same. I couldn't take it anymore. I had nothing. So all we did then is I remember my wife was working. Well, my, she, my wife was working. I was at Merrill Lynch. I got, and, the, and I was about to be very close to being homeless because I had no money left. I couldn't pay the next month's rent. The NFL granted me in 2013, they had just started the Gene Upshaw Trust Assistance Fund. They had just started it that year. It started that January. I was one of the first people to get approved for that program. And it saved my butt because they paid four months of my bills to my creditors rent, uh, for my landlord for the rent, cars, all that kind of stuff. Well, car, we only had one car. We were able to get a car because they took care of, we were able to get one car. And I remember I was like, man, what am I going to do here? I was at Merrill Lynch, not like my co- I kept going to work, got fired about two months later, all my fault. I was not doing well on the practice test. Everything was my fault. Got a job the next day. You know, construction company, give me a company truck, phone, laptop, give me first week's pay. Like, yes, I'm back. I remember my wife asking me, did you get a contract from them? 
I said, no, why do I need that? Company truck, phone, laptop, pay like, we contract, it's my contract's right here. Five days later, I'm fired. They shut down the company's the sales division. So fired two times in a week. I ended up coming to get a job teaching football to the kids in my area, youth, and I was a part-time custodian making $8.25 an hour on the graveyard shift, night shift. To answer your question, my mentality shift, my rock bottom moment was not being a custodian. I was grateful for the job. I was at my rock bottom when somebody's trash got on my bare skin at three, about, it's about four o'clock in the morning on my ship. And I said, man, what the hell has happened to my life? I'm sitting here, someone's trash on my skin, making $8.25 an hour. We were able to buy like a 19... 85, 86, like green 50, 150 pickup, uh, green F 150 pickup truck. And so we had two cars, but both, one car we were paying like 40% interest on. The other car was like a, you know, no driver's seat, no air, no radio. It was just like a, it was like a Fred Sanford and son, you know, pickup truck. And I remember saying, man, what happened to me? And this two years ago, I was the largest African American subcontractor in the city of Baltimore. Just two years ago, what happened to me? I realized what happened to me was that I stopped taking ownership for the mistakes. Nobody made me do that extra work for that client. I did it. Nobody told me to over leverage myself. I did it. So I started taking extreme ownership of my life. That's when I came home, wrote down my goals of becoming a keynote speaker. And that's when my journey started to change. But it started to change with me problem solving the biggest problem of them all, which was me. Yeah. I mean, first, the, and we kind of touched on it a second, that Gene Upshaw player assistance trust, I, that coming out the first, I mean, the year, man, it's, it's the year you needed it. It couldn't have been a year later. Could have been a year later. It couldn't, it, no, because the program, when it came out a year later, I'm in trouble. What a blessing. They paid a bit off your debt. They kind of got you back on your feet. That's a huge blessing. More importantly, what I hear from that, I mean, obviously, at the point you were at, some cards have got, you got to have a little luck involved. And I would say that being released that year, that's considered your luck. And the rest of it is hard work, right? And you willing to keep your head down and grind. I think I wrote a quote down just because I thought at some point it'd come up and I'm glad I can use it. But you don't become your hopes and dreams, rather you fall to the level of training, right? The level of your training. I think you speak that perfectly. So I'm going to get out of this lull. I know we're about halfway through here. Get out of this lull of you hit rock bottom, you've got this trust, you start to work, you've mentioned this, you've picked up this speaker role and you've started to speak a bit. What all do you have going on now? And how are you generating wealth? Is the speaking gig sort of your number one? And do you have any other avenues that are producing income today? Great. So what we have is, again, my wife owns the business and it's all built off, I call it the Tony Robbins model of speaking. Speaking leverages into other things, coaching, consulting. My first book came out in 2015. My second book, The Success Cycle, I've given a couple copies to some people, some of my clients, some other people that in my network, and people are already saying, Marcus, I'm halfway through this, or I'm at chapter, this chapter, this chapter. It's amazing. Because my first book was my autobiography. This book is a roadmap to help you get from A to Z. Not A to B, A to C, A to Z. If you can apply ambition, drive, and hard work in that success cycle, if you can be ambitious enough to write out your goals and go and and achieve, it's like seek, not go and get. If you can have drive to have inspiration for a long haul systemic change, not motivation for a short term gain, you can be successful and then you finish it off with hard work. Focus on yourself, not your competition and hit the button for it, repeat. If you can do that for your business, your situation, your point of where you are in life, you can achieve success. We also take equity ownership in parts of businesses, technology-based, 
some other things where people are trying to grow a business and they're looking for us to kind of help them get more exposure. And we do that by leveraging our social media and our network. So, and again, it's all about the training that we have. We have corporate training, workshops that we do, et cetera. So everything comes off the Tony Robbins model. And what we're actually doing right now is when the process of really ramping up and gearing up to get our online courses and stuff going, our online products. So if people can't assist on this, I'm trying to do. I want everybody to be able to have the best chance to achieve wealth and success for their life. But not everybody can afford to pay me, you know, what it takes for us, for our business to do our one-on-one coaching or for our business to come out and do a keynote speech. We understand that. So we created the success cycle in our, our first book and now our second book. So you can buy for like $25, right? It gives you, like I was telling us on another podcast earlier, at the time, it was all of my knowledge that I had to grow from where I was making $8 an hour, you know, in 2013 to where I was in 2018 when we finished up with the book and then turned into the editor. So that's five years of all my knowledge. Now, today, I've gotten more knowledge, more content, more experience, and that's just going to put into our next book. But that was the information all I had at the time to get you what I could get you. Now, again, I can't sit there and give you everything I do in a speech or everything I do in a one-on-one coaching because I just don't have all the time, but it's a ton of knowledge to help you in your life. Ton of knowledge. So if you can't afford a penny for something higher, do a $25 book. If you can't, you know what I'm saying? If you want something a little bit more, you can buy a course. We have a speaking course that we're relaunching for $47. We have another course on mental toughness over physical limitations. That's $74. So we're in the process of really ramping up and gearing up for a lot of the things that we have on the online side. I'm actually talking to a guy tomorrow who's personally coached by Brendan Bouchard, who's an extremely wealthy, very good keynote speaker, good executive coach. Another guy, the same guy gets coached by Dean Graziosi, who's part with Tony Robbins. So we're looking to work together to try to create some products and things like that that we'll do together that will launch online for 2020. So like to answer your question, a short, concise answer is everything we have is built off of speaking and it kind of just, you know, expands from there. Yeah, that record label model of I'm going to own everything. I'm going to be the producer of my own music and the content that I create. If I want to bring someone up, maybe at some point you want to have another speaker get involved, right? And you'd own that content as well. I mean, that's something that, I'm, that I've heard a couple times as each of those avenues produce revenue for you, you know, speaking is coming, your book is, is going to start producing revenue, the coaching business is going to start producing revenue. Is that all going back into one bucket? Are each of those investing in themselves? You know, are you taking your coaching business and putting that back into coaching marketing and, and maybe emails or an email book? Yeah. So like when we start making money from online courses, we'll take money from the online courses and do more Facebook ads, more Google ads, more marketing. The book, take that money and do some more Facebook ads and maybe do some things like maybe invest getting onto the right type of a show if necessary or, or doing a, P, a small PR firm. Speaking will invest back into, you know, creating the next PowerPoint or creating or flying to the next event or hiring a videographer or put it into the website. Absolutely, yes. That's the model that we have. I mean, it's a very similar model just to handle your personal expenses, right? Money that's coming in, if, if you were owning real estate and you own stocks and you own... The, the money that your homes produce, you'd likely want to pump those back into another home or to beefing that home up. And the money that your index funds are producing, you're going to pull that out. You'd likely want to put that back in index funds or bonds or whatever. You kind of want to keep those buckets in there or keep the money that's being produced in those buckets. How are you doing that yourself today? Do you have a, I think you mentioned at the top of the call, you've got a financial advisor or a planner that you're related to. Are, are they tackling all this for you? and kind of helping you manage your funds or are you running point on that? So right now, yes, my brother-in-law is a very successful financial planner. He works with clients, very, very wealthy. He took, so he took us on because we're family, like I'm married to his, young, to his youngest sister. And, you know, he sees the value and he also, he's an entrepreneur also. And so he sees, and he's seen me since day one. Like when I got here, because when I met him, I was doing very well. And then six months, seven months later, I'm broke. So and he's been through some similar things in his life experiences. And he knows are grinding when he sees it. So we take point on that. And what we're doing right now is 
everything we have is kind of in the MMA gaining interest because we're gonna buy we're gonna be buying a home this year. As we purchase the home, we're gonna start doing more investments, index funds, stocks, things of that nature, as we go ahead and get our home secured and purchased for our future. Because again, with my bankruptcy, we couldn't buy a home until 2020. And my wife had a bankruptcy as well. So, but again, as far as when we start getting back into investments and things like that, I mean, I mean, I get educated on it, but he takes the lead because, you know, that is his area of expertise. And then again, we brought in an accountant that my brother-in-law works with him, like, you know, things of that nature. We're trying to keep everything we can in-house where I can touch it in a dry. Like I had an old account before, not, and he was a good guy, not a bad guy, but some things he was doing would take a little bit longer. Where I won't say it was questionable, but sometimes it was just a delayed process. And but he was in Texas. I couldn't get. I couldn't jump in my car and get to him. So I was at the mercy of waiting for him. But now my our financial planner, our tax accountant, our bookkeeper, our lawyer, everything that's very pri- privy to our business on the back end, our website person, one of my partners who does content creation. We only have two people of our team that aren't here one is in new jersey handles all about like our our podcast you know um you know books us on podcast media and endorsement deals and then our speaker manager she is in chicago but my content creation partner is local to raleigh our website designer seo guy and a digital marketing guy who's amazing by the way he's in raleigh our accountant our wealth manager our bookkeeper our lawyer, all in Raleigh. Like I can get to everybody in the drive, and pretty much everybody in like within like a thirty minute drive. Yeah. So I'm going to double down. One, you've mentioned a couple times your wife owns the business. I'm assuming that's due to just the financial status that the bankruptcy is that why she owns that. Great question. Yes, and it's also as a woman-owned business, right? Minority is great, but it takes a lot longer. Women-owned businesses in Raleigh, in North Carolina, have a few perks. So we kind of went, we went, we went that way. Man, that makes a lot of sense. As far as the, the financial planner, I mean, it's great. He's part of the family. So you're at least seeing him a couple times a year at holidays. Yeah, saw him yesterday. Yeah. yeah. How about uh, when you take the family cap off and you put the business hat on? I'm assuming he's dealing with your business and personal finances. How often do you see him? And I'm going to ask even a tougher question of, you don't need to share it, but do you, are you pretty comfortable knowing like asset allocation, like what sits where he's dealing with that, but you know where your money's at. Absolutely. We go through all that. It's very upfront and honest. He's, we get, we have, um, he owns a company called Copperly, but it's part of Fidelity. So like, you know, when we're doing investments and stuff, everything kind of comes out right straight up, squared away into, you know, we have an app where we can go and see everything, like where's our money at, what have we made, you know, what we lost that day before. Like it's, I mean, it's very much uh, like a nice little pie chart. Everything's right there for us to see right online, you know. And again, that's the same thing we're setting up right now with our account and our bookkeeper is giving them limited access to our bank accounts to be able to do all the stuff, you know, the ex- income, the expenses, all that type of stuff. So all that kind of plays to the same to the same pro- uh, process. Well, I think as I wrap my side up, I do have your experience and your past. I could spend another hour diving into some of the hurdles that you had to leap over. From a wealth perspective, you've hit rock bottom. Your wife's hit rock bottom. You've seen sort of both ends of the spectrum. Is there anything that you wish, specifically from a wealth side, from a wealth perspective, that you would have started five, 10 years ago? Yes. I wish when I was in the NFL... Every year, I would have took money out and put it into my 401k because I didn't realize that when you retire from the NFL, you, that's no longer your employer, you can't put more money in. I didn't realize that. You know, and again, I know they probably said it or someone did, but when you're young and you don't really, and you're like, you know, you don't, you're kind of in the motion of going through stuff and you're trying to work on your game and you're worried about playing either the Colts the next week or the Texans or in the char, you know, whoever you're playing in that week. As a rookie, I didn't hear that. So I could have put the max in, which I think at that time would have been like, they would allow you to put max in like 15K. You know, so it's somewhere around like, like the 15K range. You could put in max per year. They would match it. They would double it. So they would match it. So, but again, because again, they're using the money to, for their business. So they're going to give it back to you and they're going to double it. So I could have been sitting on more money today if I had known that 
and I could have took money out of my hands. Now, thank God, I wasn't one of those, uh, wasn't a rookie that blew his money on stuff. Like, I remember I bought a house after my rookie season. I actually remember making like close to 50 grand on that. Like, I bought it in 2003, then I got traded to the Ravens. I ended up selling it in 2005. I bought it for 280, I sold it for 330. That's a good investment, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was in a gated community, berm on the back. It was one floor, probably about 2,500 square feet. Everything was on one floor. I mean, it was nice for a family. It had three bedrooms off to the right, master and bathroom, and everything off to the left. Huge kitchen, nice sit room, you know, all that. I mean, I, mean, I, I made 50 grand in two years. So, but I, I just wish I'd have known more and paid more attention to what I could have done with the 401k plan, if I, when I was playing, I would have put a lot more money away. I'd have maxed out every year if I'd have really thought about it. Yeah, I would have really thought about that more as a uh, player if I had really been listening to that information. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, but I didn't realize NFL offered up a retirement program. I mean, that's huge, man. And that's great advice of, I mean, right out of the gate, and that's in any occupation. My little brother is getting ready to go into the workforce. He's graduating this year. And I sat down with him over Christmas and he brought his little benefits pamphlet and saying, you know, this is everything that they offer. And I flipped, that's the first thing I did was flip it over to the 401k piece and start circling numbers for him. This is what they're matching. You've got to do it. If you do nothing else, if you can't afford it, minimum 7% right out of the gate. It's what they're matching. The first 7%, you're putting that in, right? And I, I think um, a lot of folks miss out on either one, not investing in it at all. And two, once you start putting that money to the side, You've got to go into that account and make sure that it's being invested somewhere, that you're not, you're not using it as a glorified sale or savings account. Right. I mean, again, like I said, absolutely. Because again, I, I was just talking about my wife about this. Like, our plan now is to, as we buy the house, is just put stuff in the savings. And she's a teacher, so she makes a set, sal- or set salary, but she's got great medical insurance and she's got great retirement as a teacher. So again, we're working on the same. It's like every paycheck, it's like $350 goes to her 401k. Like that's automatic. So like she'll end up putting away close to like, by the time she's done additional, let's say 50K in her, uh, by the time she's done 50K in her 401k, you know, she does two grand for another 20 years between 40, 50,000. Who knows if they could match? And then she has a retirement. And now I'll, I'll get retirement when I, I hit a certain point. I'll hit retirement, get my retirement at 45, I mean, at 55. And then 65, it goes up. And then again, for us, we'll have a house that we'll be paying on, all that stuff. So again, we're looking to really start, this is why I'm going to get online, of course, have our business going for residual, to take that money and put it into a 401k with my brother-in-law and get it matched and put it into more, you know, do some, some risky stocks, small percent, you know, safer, and then, you know, and then the, the real safest. Like we want to go there, but until we buy the house, we can't do anything. I mean, we can, but we're going to be very smart and wait and do that. And then after that, we'll get into more of the uh, diversification and allocation of the assets. Got it. Three, four minutes here. I've got one final. And this one's not written down. When does Marcus stop? You've seen seven, eight figures. You've seen rock bottom at 400 bucks. You're now sort of rebuilding something. What's the grind for? Well, the grind, first of all, is for my kids. I mean, I have two daughters, you know, that I want to leave a legacy for. So the grind's there. The grind is really for my, you know, my, my wife doesn't have to work. She enjoys teaching, but it's not necessary. The, it, the insurance part's great because you know, get, we get top line insurance, full coverage, all that, which is amazing, full dental. Other than that, her salary, it pays a, couple, a few bills, which is amazing. But you know, if we get these online courses like, like Dean Graziosi and Tony Robbins, when they launched their online products, made 40 million the first week, right? I mean, the first week, right? So I want to find the right partner who knows how to set all that stuff up for a bigger pie. But why can't that be me? I mean, like, who would have thought six years ago, I would have been where I am now when I was basically scrubbing baseboards, pushing a broom, vacuuming hallways, taking trash out, had an F-150 green pickup truck that was, it had a scratched up bed, you know, the passenger seat was missing. Like, who would have thought any of that from where I was then and now? So why not another five years? Can I, why can't I have a course with the right part in the right process does a $10, 20000000 million launch, right? I mean, it's, I mean, it's easier to go from where I am to there than where I was six years ago making eight bucks an hour to where I am now. 
So for me, it's about the legacy where I can travel with my wife. I'm still, I mean, we're still young. I mean, my wife had my oldest daughter, who's my stepdaughter, when she was young. So she's about to be 16. I'm 39. Then my wife is 37. Yeah, you know, she'll be 30. She's 37. She'll be 38 in, in March. So travel, be able to do things we want to do when we want to do them. And then really it's about just what people think about you when you're gone. Like I saw something on The Rock where a guy who was like the CEO of Paramount Pictures said, there's not one person that he knows that has anything bad to say about The Rock. Not one. So that says something. Like, you know what I'm saying? He's not just this nice guy on TV. He's this nice guy all the time. So, and that's what the guy says, that that's who he is as core. So to me, it's just about what is the legacy that's left, right, while I'm here and then when I'm gone. So I work hard. And that's, and really, man, that's what the success cycle is. I want as many people to read that because I believe so many people say all the time, well, all these speakers, these people that are thought leaders don't share information, which to a lot of point they don't, or they'll share the bare minimum just so they can kind of, you know, get by or make money off you to kind of go to their longer picture. The more you share with people, the more likely you're going to make money from people seeing the value over the long haul. So I'm hopeful that success like leads us to more speaking engagements, more podcasts, more media. But it's kind of like what happened with my, one of my mentors, Mel Robbins, the five second rule. Her book's amazing, but it's not like this huge, thought out, long, you know, it's things to get you off the couch. This success cycle is things to get you out of anywhere you are. If you're doing good, you want to be doing great. This is a book for you. If you're doing great, but you want to be doing a legacy, this is a good for you, a book for you. If you're at legacy and you want to leave the imperial forever wisdom legacy, this book is for you. If you're at rock bottom, you want to get to a place of stability, this book is for you. It's so many action steps. It's different exercises. It's different things you can do in the book. It's different questions it's going to ask you. How do you look at this? And how do you do that? Well, if I do this, why? Then what is the why? Like, it's a very laid out, very well organized process to help you get from A to Z. But if you don't read the book, you can't get any better. I was going to say that. One, I'm super stoked for the book. I've obviously got it pre-ordered. It comes out January 28th, and you can get that on Amazon. When I was preparing for this, listening to you speak, you're very prescriptive. And you're giving actionable items of, write this down, do this in the next two weeks. Write this down and do this, and you'll see this impact. And it's very, uh, you're not talking in theories and whimsical shit, right? It's very prescriptive and getting stuff done, which I, I'm really pumped to see and, and read about in the book. Marks, where can uh, the folks that want to follow up here and maybe connect with you personally? I know you've got a jump, brother. Where can we find you and how can they connect with you? Great question. They can find me at my website, which is www.marcus, M-A-R-Q-U-E-S, Ogden, O-G-D-E-N.com. I'm on LinkedIn, at Marcus Ogden. I'm on Facebook, at Marcus Ogden. Instagram is at Marcus Ogden. And then I'm on Twitter, is at Marcus underscore Ogden. So you can find me anywhere. You can shoot me an email at um, Marcus underscore Ogden at yahoo.com or Marcus Ogden at MarcusOgden.com. He's got uh, two books out, Sleepless Nights, which I believe, I think you mentioned it's on Audible as well. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. That's already out. Then we can get the success cycle. It's going to be pre-ordered on Audible or on Amazon. That'll be out late next month. Guys, I really appreciate your time, Marcus. Thank you very much. And for the rest of the team here, for the rest of the followers, thank you all for your ears and stay on that grind. How interesting and Really amazing is it to hear things from an NFL athlete's perspective, both in how they treat and take care of their players. Because to be frank, I really was surprised in, in the amount of support they actually receive, especially as it sounds like things are continuing to get better, but also in how absorbed you are in that moment as a player, right? Marcus echoed several times, he had a finance background, what was looking to build wealth, but caught up in the moment, was lacking or missing out on one of the most basic or simple things you could possibly do from a wealth building perspective, right? Building or saving for your retirement, investing in your 401k, at least to your company match. That is going to be my biggest and my number one takeaway from today. Please take that lesson that Marcus sort of emphasized there at the end of our podcast. If this is not something you're doing today, 
sit down over the next few hours, next couple of days, whenever you have a second and get this done. Find out how much money you can invest or put to the side. Put this money, at least maximize your company's match if that's a possibility and start to save for the retirement. That's been echoed on every Certified Financial Planners podcast. You've got someone in the real world, uh, an ex-NFL football player talking about this today. I'm happy to field any questions you guys have around this if you need some help. Info at roadstowealth.com. This decision alone could literally make you, save you tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Really want to bring that one home. I've got two other takeaways. The second one is no matter the size of your organization, run a tight ship. Know what you're selling, know who's involved, ensure that you've got the proper types of legal protection, right? I just finished this book from Laura Pennington, who will be on the podcast tomorrow. And one of the first points that she brings up, and I'm going to talk to her about it when she comes on, is outsourcing to you know find someone that's really good, find yourself a good legal guy, and then outsource a few hours to him where he can help you build an NDA and a contract and other sorts or types of protection that we're going to be unable to draft the language for, but will really save you in the long run, right? Marcus did that deal there and lost $4 million on a handshake to where if he would have had some sort of legal protection, whether he decided to take action on it or not, he would have at least had more ground to stand on. Finally, I guess real quick, can you imagine sitting in that room where that guy claimed, take this as a learning experience, Marcus? I would have, oh my God, I would have blew up. Uh, I, I uh, finally, my, my third takeaway here, and I thought the timing of this podcast was really good as far as release, and that I've at this point met with dozens of guests. I've heard over 40 stories, right, from different guests at this point. And some of these stories have been, you know, rather straightforward, their methods, more approaches to success. Others have been very windy and creative to date. I've not met anyone that's had to overcome more adversity than Marcus Ogden has. This losing the $4 million deal was working with loan sharks, lost his cars, was in a really, really bad spot, couldn't get any help from the bank. But his ambition, his drive, his hard work, this man was able to climb out of a hole that just felt too deep to get out of. And truthfully, climb to the top of a really competitive field. I'd ask that we take this sort of lesson as inspiration and draw some parallels to our own lives. And that, you know, there are some horrific things going on today, all related to this, this virus and some of the other chaos going on out here, health, emotional, financial, reflect back on Marcus, this story, his grind, know that that we, you can do this. As always, if you have 30 seconds, please drop a, uh, a review wherever you're tuning into this podcast as it helps me continue to book and interview some of these kick-ass guests like you've listened to over the last few weeks. Any comments, questions, feedback, you can find me at info at roadstowealth.com. I appreciate all the love and support there. That's all I have for you guys this week. Be friendly to one another. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys or giving you an interview next week. Stay on your grind. So smooth. You know what I'm saying? Keep on making the beat, by the way. Just let y'all know what's going on. <laughs> Tell me. It's the, it's the, it's the road of the wealth. For health, yeah, yeah. She, it's the road to the wealth, yeah, yeah. Uh, with my kids and my spouse, yeah, yeah. She, it's the road to the wealth. Uh, I do it for health, yeah. With my kids and my spouse, yeah. I financially sound, uh, yeah, yeah. It's the road to the wealth, yeah. I do it for health, yeah. With my kids and my spouse, yeah. I financially sound, you bad dad. If life about purpose, it gives you something to seek in. Uh, I've been setting cash goals, financially speaking. Uh, I've been finding blessings through all of these demons. Uh, I pray to God, I give you something to reach with. Uh, 
See, I keep something to leave with. This life about goals and achievements. Your eyes on the prize, the head out your mind. They pray to whatever beliefs in. Teach on the way. Know that they're beach on the way. Gotta shine hard in the teacher's water. Know that little seed, they gon' grow tomorrow. So every day, gotta come with us. Shoot. So they give you something to stand on. Make the fuss off when you land raw. Make you put some new friends on. It's a road to the world. I do it for help. Yeah. My kids and my spouse. Yeah. I financially sound. Bad daddy. It's the road to the wealth. Yeah. I do it for help. Yeah. My kids and my spouse. Yeah. I financially sound. You the bad daddy.